Welcome to all of you this morning. Welcome online audience. It's so good to have you in this place. We've got a full house this morning and uh, so glad you're here. When I say welcome into our, our space, into our place, it's almost like uh, we like to think of it as a welcome into the living room. Uh, we come together as uh, brothers and sisters where it's kind of a family gathering under one God, right? Serving one God, Lord, Father. We welcome our guests uh, this morning. If you're here for the very first time, we want to give you a very special welcome to Grand Point. I think we have some guests from Make-A-Wish Foundation. Welcome into the house this morning. We'll talk to you a little bit about that today, but uh, welcome. So here's what happens. Sometimes we welcome people into our home as well. Penny and I love to have people into our home. And uh, when we do that, we're sometimes reminded of how much we have allowed things in our house to be broken for way too long. For example, we have this trash can that has been a staple in our home for a long, long time. It's an amazing trash can. And one of the reasons why we bought this trash can was because of the foot pedal lid opener. I mean, you gotta love that. Foot pedal lid openers just make life so much easier. I mean, you can actually text with one hand and take trash to this with the other hand. If you're cracking an egg, you have, you know, the parts of the egg in each hand. You just hit this hands free. You put it in there. If you have a dustpan and a brush, right? You, you have one in each hand. You don't even have to lay one of those down before you deposit the dirt. You just hit this foot pedal. I mean, it is one of the most life saving, life changing devices ever. It makes life easy. It makes life comfortable. It is super, super efficient. So we use this trash can a lot. In fact, um, my grandkids came up with this uh, little game. They, they uh, like this foot pedal thing, and they're like, hey, Pop Pop, did you see what's on top of the trash can? Like, look really, really close. I get, like, look closer, right? And then they stump that thing and you know, smack me in the face. Could be one of the reasons why it's broken. So it's broken. So we've used this for a long time, and one day we discovered that, ah, oh, nothing happens. One of the most devastating days of our life to realize that the foot pedal trash can lid opener does not work. Because now that means that we have to do something different. It doesn't work anymore. We're like, ah, oh, there goes all that convenience and that comfort and that efficiency in, in life and even the fun that we have with the grandkids. So now we have to open it like this. You still can open it, just not with a foot pedal. So the first couple of times after this pedal was broken, you know, we out of habit, out of norm, would come over and we'd be like, ah, oh, that's right, it's broken, right? So then we, you know, do this. Next couple times that happened again and pretty soon, you know, we began coming over to the trash can and the first thing that we do is this. We open it, don't even, we ignore the foot pedal because now it's becoming somewhat ingrained in our minds. The foot pedal doesn't work, it's broken. So this is now the norm. Now, this has become such a normal for us. This is our new normal. We don't even think of the trash can as broken anymore. Like we look at it, it looks perfect. Foot pedal's still there. Looks like it should work, right? But we don't even use it. We don't think of it as broken. So the first thing that we do when we go to the trash can is this. You know, so now when someone comes over to our house, though, and sometimes we invite people in and they want to help around the kitchen and they're putting trash away or whatever, you know, we frequently look over and they're like, <laughs> and they're, I can tell they're feeling like really, really stupid. And then we look at them and say, no, it, it, it's broken. We have to go through the whole explanation of how this is broken and you have to open it like this. Now, I'm sure every time that I do that, I can just picture those people walking away thinking, man, they ought to do something about that, right? <laughs> but for us, it's the new normal. And so we don't even see it broken. Sometimes that happens in life. There's something that is broken. And at first, it's a big deal, right? The fractured relationship, it bothers us and it, it hurts us every time we see it or we see that person, Right, but we don't do anything about it. You know, the reason I still have this is because I'm too cheap to buy a new one. It's only like 79 bucks, but I'm too cheap to buy it. So I'd rather just create a new normal, right? And uh, work with this trash can. And sometimes we do that with life, right? We just don't want to put the time into it. We don't want to put the cost into it or the work into it to fix it. So we let it go and we let it go. And pretty soon this brokenness becomes a normal for us. It's the new normal. We look at it. We don't even see it as broken anymore. So I look out through this audience today. You all look perfect. 
Uh, and maybe you are, but maybe there's someone here that is broken. I, w- I couldn't tell because it, it looks just like this. But deep down inside, the norm for you is, is living out of that brokenness. Maybe it's something that you did a long time ago. You told a lie or you cheated or something like that. And you knew at that moment that it was wrong. It bothered you like crazy for a little while. But after time went on, the new normal became, ah, oh, you're just living with it. Just going to live with it. I don't want to go back and make this right anymore. It's too costly to fix it right now. Too much time has passed and you live with this new normal. The problem is when you live with a normal of brokenness, you will never, never be what God intended you to be. You can only be who God intended you to be when you're healed, when you're living out of fullness, when you're living out of healing. I want to tell you a story today from Mark chapter 5, and this is part of our series. For those of you that are new, watching online, uh, this is a series called Questions Jesus Asked. All throughout the New Testament, Jesus asked questions, and he didn't ask questions because he needed information from us. He didn't ask questions because... Uh, you know, he needed to know something. No, he asked questions because he wanted the people that he was asking questions to, to kind of work out an answer, think about an answer in their lives. And so the question that he's asking today comes from the gospel of John chapter five. Jesus had just been in Cana of Galilee. Cana is where he performed his first miracle of turning water into wine. And while he was in Cana, he also healed this, uh, Mark chapter four talks about his healing of an official son. We don't know exactly what was wrong with the son, but he was sick. He was ill. Jesus healed him. And all the people around there saw this healing that happened. They saw Jesus take care of this man's brokenness. And they were like, wow, we want Jesus. The boy became a Christian. His entire family came to know Christ. And now in chapter 5, it begins like this. It says, after this, that was the healing. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. The Jews celebrate five feasts. Three of those include the obligation to go to Jerusalem to celebrate it. It's the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. All those would happen in Jerusalem. Now, this feast that's mentioned in uh, Mark chapter 5 could have been any one of those three. We're not told which one it was, but in chapter 2, it says, Now, there is in Jerusalem. They're all gathered in Jerusalem, right? Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool In Aramaic, it's called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these colonnades, among the columns in this area, lay a multitude of invalids. There's blind, there's lame and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, and he knew that he had already been lying there for a long time, he said to him, here's the question, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, if I ever get a chance to go, there's always someone that steps in ahead of me. So Jesus looked at him and he said to him, take up your bed and walk. At once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Uh, The pool of Bethesda is one of those interesting Bible stories where we, we really don't get the full story. There are some details that are in this story that help make it what it is, but there's also some details that are only recognized through certain manuscripts of the Bible. So it depends on what translation of the Bible that you have. It may or may not include some of the details that we're we're talking about. But there are characters in the story, but there's also a bit of backstory which is only hinted at. But let me tell you what we do know about this story. Uh, the, the, the text says that the pool of Bethesda was by one of Jerusalem's gates, known as the Sheep Gate, and it was surrounded by these five colonnades or covered columns. Now, to set this up, maybe just picture like the Chambersburg Aquatic Center or something like that, where you have a pool here and a canopy, you know, different places where people could be laying around another pool. In fact, uh, archaeologists have done some work on this, and they thought that maybe this pool of Bethesda was situated or located right beside a, a dam where they dammed up water and kept water for a reservoir and it allowed it to flow into this pool. Others think that it goes just located next to another, another pool. But whatever it was, uh, there's also some debate on what these pools were used for. Like were they used for ritual bathing or were they used for healing pools? 
Uh, the Romans would build these in their pagan temples often where they would have these cold water pools or hot water pools for, for healing. Either option uh, would have made this place a site uh, for people to visit frequently. Pools and baths were not just for uh, hygienic purposes. In fact, ancient sources also served, uh, ancient sources tell us that these pools serve medicinal purposes. So if you had a cold water pool and you took this plunge into cold water, some of you know what that's like, the ice plunge, whatever, it does something to you and your, your system and, and it brings some healing and refreshment. Hot water pools were also used for medicinal purposes. In fact, some of the times they would even drink hot water as a medicine. Medicine, kind of like we drink hot herbal teas or, or, or whatever. So we don't know whether this was a hot or cold water pool, but uh, the one thing that we do know is that it was either hot or cold because of medicinal purposes, which is why we believe that in Revelation chapter 3, when Jesus talks about the church of Laodicea, he says to them, listen, you're neither hot nor cold. And because you're lukewarm, I'm going to just spew you. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because there was nothing healing about lukewarm. It's either hot or cold. So we aren't told which one this is. It could have been either, but it made this a perfect healing site. But there's also some indications in this story that there was something more to this pool than just providing good water. When Jesus asked the invalid man if he wanted to be healed, did you notice what he said? He said, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. That implies at some times the pool's water was being stirred. It's like someone hit the jets button, right? And now the whirlpool started. So we're not exactly sure what that was, but some manuscripts, and maybe your Bible has this, but some manuscripts include this extra line that says, people waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters, and the first person that got into the pool in these swirling waters, that person was healed. That's why everyone tried to get in there first. They would be cured of whatever disease that they had. But since that line does not appear in all the manuscripts of the Bible, it's kind of hard to say how accurate that is. But that being said, that extra line explains why this man answered the way that he did. Now, if you watch this on The Chosen, right, you saw the, the water swirling and you saw people wanting to get in there as quickly as possible when the water was moving. But never, evidently, this pool had this reputation, though, for healing. Now, at first glance, when Jesus walks into this space, he walks into the colonnades, he walks into the pools, right? And he asked this man a question. At first glance, the question seems rather ridiculous, doesn't it? Do you want to be healed? Well, of course. I've been laying here for 38 years in this condition. Of course, I I want to be healed. In fact, it might even seem a little bit rude that Jesus would ask that. But the Bible tells us, this story tells us that he was an invalid for 38 years. That means he's immobile. He's not able to move. He's helpless and he's hopeless. We're not told in the story what caused this condition. Maybe he was 38 years old, having been born in this condition. Maybe something happened. Maybe there was an accident or disease that left him an invalid. But what we do know is that this caused his, his helplessness and hopelessness caused this sense of, of uh, trauma for his family. It was devastating to him. This had now become his normal for 38 years. But listen, his new normal is not a broken foot pedal lid opener on a trash can. His new normal, though, is a soul that's broken. It's a desire within him that just doesn't work. But this man has been in this condition for so long that he learned to live with it. This was his normal life. Every single day, every single day, he would come here to the pool of Bethesda. He'd lay there, and he'd wait for someone to help him. He'd imagine perhaps just how different his life could be if he could just get into that pool. But every day he leaves disappointed, a little more hopeless. Every day he feels a little bit more like a victim. Now, a victim mentality is when a person is found frequently blaming others and having trouble accepting personal responsibility. Hey, we all have days when we feel like the world is against us, don't we? 
I want you to see what this man said when Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? He didn't say yes, or he didn't say no, but he came up with excuses. He said, the first thing he said, when Jesus said, do you want to be healed? He's like, I have no one to help me. There's no one to help me get into the pool. Seriously? 38 years you've been doing this? You haven't built any relationship. You haven't had anyone come beside you. You don't have any friends that are going to help you. And furthermore, he says, when I do you know, try to get in, there's always somebody else jumps ahead of me, right? The victim mentality. I want to take this moment to ask you, where are you allowing stuff to remain broken in your life? So, so this man for 38 years says, again, I, I'm kind of just maybe thinking through this a little bit, and I don't, I don't want to put into the text what's not there. But you think he could have gotten some help and maybe didn't? Could have he gotten past this blaming at some point and taken some responsibility? I, I don't know. But listen, I know that that's, that's our lot. We can sit back and be victims or take on a victim mentality, or we can step out and we can make a, make a difference. We, we can take some responsibility for where we are. Again, I want to just take this moment and ask you the question, where are you allowing some things to remain broken in your life? Where do you feel helpless? Where do you feel hopeless? Is there any place in your life where you're thinking, if only, if only I could be cured of my physical disease, if only I could experience victory over my addiction, if only I could get a grip on this anxiety that's paralyzing me. If only I could get over these fears that I have constantly. If only I could relive my past. Oh, if only. If only I could be healed of my brokenness. If only I could be a victor instead of a victim. Is there any place in your life where you're allowing a what-if scenario to occur? Now, as you're thinking about the answer to that question, I want you to picture Jesus walking into that space. Because that's what he does. I want you to picture Jesus walking into your, your, uh, to the pool where you're lying. And you know, he's in Jerusalem right now. It's very crowded. Everyone's there for the feast. This is even more crowded than the Shippensburg Fair was. Right? More people here. And you know what Jesus does? He walks right past the influential people. He walks right past the palace. And he walks right into the area where there is brokenness. You see, when Jesus walks into your space, he doesn't come into the space of just influential people, people that are whole, people that are healed, people that can serve him. When Jesus comes, he doesn't just go into palaces and into nice uh, places. No, he walks right into areas where there's brokenness. He walks right into places where there's hurt. He walks right into places where there's need. And so as you're thinking about the places of brokenness in your life, picture Jesus walking right into those places. Going past the whole people, the healed people, the influential people. Going past the palaces but coming right into where you are. And he's asking you, do you want to be made well? Now, that question and this story shows us something about Jesus and, and his intersection with human life, right? He cares about the hurting. He cares about the broken. He cares about those who need healing. In fact, that's where his heart is. This is why he walks past the other people and, and comes right to us. I want to I want to leave you with a couple points here this morning, and I want to tell you a couple stories. But these points are on your outline if you have that. And number one is this, and these are takeaways. Keep this in your mind or maybe on your notes. But here's this: Jesus is walking into the space of your helpless and your hopeless situation, and he's calling your name. Do you hear him? He goes right to this one individual in our story. He does that the same. He walks right into our space and he calls you by name. Do you hear him? The second thing I want you to know is this, because Jesus lives and listen, we believe that he does, which is why we do what we do here at Grand Point Church. We believe that Jesus is a risen living savior and he's walking, he's working, he's doing things in our lives right now. He's alive, right? 
And so he walks right in because Jesus is alive. Listen, hurting people can find real hope. Do you believe it? You believe it. Let me tell you a couple of stories that come right from Grand Point. I think I love, the, I love telling these stories just because I like to brag on Grand Point people, right? Kind of like to identify with, with this. Let me tell you a story about Josh. Josh and Jan Beck and their sons, Levi and Sam, have been coming here to church. And Josh, if you're watching online, we just want to give a shout out to you this morning. They're not here this weekend because they're in Leadville, Colorado. Josh is in Leadville, Colorado because on Saturday, he's going to be riding in the Leadville 100 mountain bike race. This is called the race of all races. Probably one of the most grueling and uh, arduous rides ever in the world. So he's going to be riding 100 miles on a mountain bike in the Rocky Mountain terrain at an elevation of up to 12,600 feet. Now, the reason I think this is noteworthy, and Josh, we wish you well on that. Train well this week. But the reason we believe that, I believe that is noteworthy is because eight months ago, Josh was diagnosed with cancer. And he went through surgery, went through the treatments, had to be isolated for a while, went through radiation, went from doctor to doctor to doctor, and all the while his family was taking this journey. On top of all that, on top of that personal crisis, he was caring for his parents, wonderfully a uh, caretaker for his parents who, was, who are both going through some finan- or, or physical challenges of their own, some with cancer. In addition to that, Josh is also in, uh, of no you know, re- reason of his own, but he's going through some career changes right now and is and discovering, trying to discover where God is leading him. But all of these things could be deterrents in his life that would keep him from doing or, or accomplishing his dream. But Josh is in Leadville today because he has not allowed deterrence to determine his life. See, these deterrents are not unlike the ones that we face. Every day of our life, there's things that come at us, things that challenge us, things that might deter us from taking, from, from, from living our dream or living out what we think that life should be. They deter us from our purpose, perhaps, but Josh and his family have said no. No, we're not going to allow these deterrents to determine our life. Let me tell you about Zach. Zach and his wife, Tessa, and their daughters attend here at Grand Point uh, Church. Uh, Sergeant Stinson uh, was on his first deployment in Afghanistan in 2010. And on November 9th, while on foot patrol, he stepped on an IED, which resulted in the devastating uh, amputation of both of his legs. His right leg was amputated just below the knee, and his left leg was amputated just above his knee. He now has no legs. Lost the fingers on his right hand, but every Sunday, Zach wheels in here, comes through the doors, comes into this church, and Zach gives you one of the best handshakes ever, even though he doesn't have all of his fingers on there. He has the best smile on his face. He has the best attitude ever. And Zach, if you're watching this morning, we just want to applaud you. It's one of the most inspirational families that I know. Yesterday, Zach arrived in Glasgow, Scotland. And Zach is in Scotland this morning, uh, kind of still adjusting to the time change, I'm sure. Uh, but he is there because he is going to participate in the UCI Cycling World Championships Paracycling Division. Zach has a time trial on Wednesday of this week. And on Friday of this week, he has a road race. And if he places in both of those areas, he will qualify for the Team USA Cycling World Championship coming up. Yeah. The reason, the reason that's noteworthy to me is because Zach has not left a disability determine his life. He's not left that determined what he can do. He has every reason to sit back and be bitter and to be angry and to be frustrated and to just kind of be that victim. But in addition to being an amazing patriot, he has also not allowed his disability to determine his life. Let me tell you about Caleb. Caleb is also an inspiration uh, to our church, Tens Grand Point Church, uh, with his family. Caleb was born with some undiagnosed physical difficulties. He could not speak for the first six years of his life. And then after a couple years where it seemed like life was improving for him, at age 10, he had a major setback once again. 
And while he went from doctor to doctor to doctor uh, over and over again, he still has not regained his physical abilities. He's, and, and, and all of this has disappointed him because he had some dreams. He had some dreams. But listen, if Jesus ever walked into his life and said, do you want to be healed? I believe that the story that we're going to hear this morning is Caleb saying, yes, but it's not in the way that you might think. But listen, I'm going to let Caleb tell you that story. So would you join me and welcome Caleb Horse to the stage this morning? <laughs> welcome, Caleb. Round three. Here we go, right? Uh, while we're getting set up there, listen, I, I, would, I just want you to know that uh, Caleb is here today because he's, his story has inspired me. Caleb lives with a lot of pain every day of his life. His body's uh, living with, with a lot of pain, arthritis, Crohn's, a uh, couple of the things there that are, that are going on in his life. But he met with me, and I saw, I saw a faith journey that Caleb has taken, which is beautiful. He never shared his faith story before. This is the first time he's sharing this. When I asked him if he would share his story, he said, can I talk about my faith? And I said, absolutely, that's what I want you to talk about, but there's more to it and the journey that he took. And uh, Caleb, I just want you to know, I'm so honored to be on the stage with you this morning. Uh, you've been an inspiration to me, and I know you will be for many. So Caleb, would you just kind of tell us your story? Thank you for letting me be able to tell my story. And so at an early age, I had several physical challenges such as speech and fine motor skills. It required me to go to therapy for many years, and through the years I had improvement in it. I could talk full sentences, um, and I was able to overcome those challenges. And um, after I overcame those challenges, we decided to adopt a little sister from Guatemala. And in 1999, my five-month-old sister arrived home, and I remember being so happy. Uh, I grabbed an armful of toys, walked them over to my sister's crib, and just threw them all into her crib because I wanted to share everything with her. Um, it was such an exciting time for me, but that excitement didn't last that long because later that spring, after we adopted my sister, I got extremely sick and I was taken to the hospital and the doctors had no idea why I was ill. And each day it got worse and my parents would pray for God to find a doctor, to find a solution, some sort of answer. And most days me and my mom were by ourselves. My dad had to stay home and watch my sister. And I continued getting really sick, lost a lot of weight. And finally, a different doctor came in. And he was not the doctor my mom was planning for. He was retiring. He was older, not very nice. Um, he examined me and went to the telephone right away and called my doctor and said, this boy has Kawasaki disease. And unless he gets treatment right now, he's not leaving this hospital with a, um, his own heart. So that was a realization that God, it wasn't what we were expecting, but God put the white doctor in to know what was going on with me. And I got better from it. And I got to go home. And about... Two years after recovering from that, we adopted three more kids from Guatemala. And the last person we adopted, my brother, I got to go to Guatemala and visit his home, go to Wayne Forest with my mom and grandma, and got to climb pyramids. And that was a really eye-opening experience for me. So soon, my family of three had turned into a family of seven, and... I was so excited to have brothers and sisters. Every day was such an exciting part, and I enjoyed every part of it. 
And another part I enjoyed was playing basketball. Um, it was my dream to make the NBA. And when I was 10 years old, I was 5'10", and doctors thought I could go up to 6'8". So hearing that in my mind, I was on my way to exciting future, I thought. Um, but that's not what happened. Um, one time I was playing at the YMCA. I was running up and down the court. Suddenly I had this pain in my legs, and my legs couldn't work anymore. And I didn't realize it then, but this was the beginning of the new chapter in my life, where my life would consist of going from doctor to doctor, getting different medicines, infusions, surgeries, going through physical therapy, and it became very depressing. Um, but I still held out hope. I would ask my mom all the time, do you think I'll be able to play basketball again? And she would always say, I hope so, and we'll see. But my illness continued getting worse yearly, and medicine wasn't helping a lot. And I still held out hope that I would get to play basketball because it would break my heart if I wasn't able to. Um, but after five years of going through medicine and going through doctor's appointments, I became more depressed, and I started to accept I might never be able to walk or run like other kids in sports do. And I slowly grew more angry with God each passing day. I kept it all inside, didn't tell anyone. I had so many questions in my heart, like, why was this happening to me? And why me, pretty much? And I had lost all my desire to pray, to go to church, to worship. I didn't plan for a future anymore. I had completely lost hope. And when I was at my worst, the doctors at Hershey Medical Center submitted my name to the Make-A-Wish program. And soon I met Miss Ellen Plummer, um, my wish granter. And she came to visit me to find out what my wish was. And my wish was to meet Kobe Bryant of the LA Lakers. And we weren't sure if they'd be able to grant that wish because he's a big name in basketball. But the Make-A-Wish worked it all out. And in 2009 of April, me and my family went to California to meet Kobe. Um, a limo came to pick us up, took us to the stadium. There was a big banner and light saying, welcome Caleb Boston family. <laughs> we got to see a playoff game between the Lakers and Jazz. And our seats were extremely close to the court. It felt like I was right there, part of the action. And so after the game, I was very anxious, waiting for Kobe. He, had came, he was coming to talk to me before he talked to the media, to the reporters. And the rest of my family, um, mainly my brothers and sisters, were all asleep because they were still on the Eastern Coast time. Um, so Kobe came in, and I was really nervous for a while, but he carried the conversation for a while, and that allowed me to settle down, and I was able to ask my questions. Um, he answered every single one. We laughed and joked about my sleeping siblings, um, our shoe sizes, one thing that never stopped growing was my feet. Um, I wear size 16 shoes, so um, he wears size 14. So um, I, I be in that. Um, so it was amazing to just be with him and be in such an amazing and happy environment. And um, they told us before he came in, we don't know how long he'll take with you be five, ten minutes. He ended up taking 45 minutes with me and kept the media waiting. They came in the door several times saying they're getting very restless and upset because uh, they wanted to talk to him after the playoff game. And he just ignored them and kept talking to me. Um, so it, I ended up leaving the stadium filled with hope and joy again. And not just because I got to meet Kobe, but I also realized that God had answered my prayer, that he loved me, he had 
we energized my faith, and he worked out something I thought was impossible. I never thought I would get to meet Kobe at that point in my life. Um, so my whole experience was a big stress release for my entire family, and it felt like this was the first time my illness didn't affect me in a negative way. But as I look back through my life and challenges, I'm not angry or upset anymore. And I know what I've gone through is God's will for me. And I have now accepted my illness. I define my illness and not the vice versa. And my sickness and pain are part of what makes me the person I am today. And I learned that life is not worry about what happens to me, but how I react to the ups and downs in my life. Every day is a choice and a decision to trust God. And whatever happens, good or bad, God remains on the throne, and that will never change. When I was at my lowest point, God showed his love to me by using others, both believers and unbelievers, to gain back that faith and hope. He showed his love to my family, and friends, and pastors, and churches, and all my doctors from Hershey, Chops, Baltimore, John Hopkins, Numas in Delaware, without all my doctors, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And now my goal is to tell my story and give that same hope and faith to children who are sick by helping support the Make-A-Wish Foundation, but also by sharing God with others by telling them all the good things he's done in my life. Mm. Kelly, thank you for thank you for sharing your story. You know, I, I wonder, you know, if you might have a bigger platform doing this than you would have playing basketball. I don't know, but you know, Caleb is willing to take this disappointment in his life, this broken dream that he had, and turn it into something good. So he's not letting disappointment again define life. So the reason I told you these three stories today from Josh and from Zach and from Caleb was because, you know, what we learned today is that deterrence, disabilities, disappointments do not need to define us. So the, the things that, and, and some of you, I, I, I could use many more of you in this audience to, this morning to tell a, a very similar story. But I think when Jesus walks into our situation, when he walks into our place and sees where we're lying, sees where we're hurting, and he asks, do you want to be healed? I think sometimes the, the, the surface level would be, well, of course I want to be healed. But I want you to know that Jesus looks beneath the surface. He doesn't always look at the surface because on the surface, that's, that's kind of what we want. But beneath the surface, he always has a bigger plan. Your illness, your disability, your disappointment, the deterrence that seemed to just be coming at you might just be God's way of shaping you and giving you a platform for his glory that you would not have otherwise. Caleb, tell us a little bit now. You work with um, uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. I know some representatives are here. Welcome. Thank you for coming in today. Uh, August 19th, there's a truck rally coming up here, and you're going to be a part of that, or at least uh, and some of you are familiar with the truck rallies that Make-A-Wish does. And... You know, all of this, everything that they do, and Caleb, correct me if I'm wrong, but all of this is to raise money, right, to help people that are going through, that, that have wishes as well, to help them realize uh, their wishes. And so what, what, what I'd like to do today is, is this. We're not asking you to give to make a wish. This is just, if you want to do this, there's a QR code that we're going to flash up on the screen there. Uh, also, on the handouts that you have in, there's a QR code. If you would just like to go right to Caleb's website uh, relating to this, you're trying to raise, what, $1,000 uh, to contribute to this? $1,000 is well on its way. Yeah, I think you're a little bit over halfway. But if any of you would like to make a contribution toward that, uh, you can just scan the QR code. If that's not your thing, if QR codes are not your thing, just Caleb's going to be sitting right up here after the service. Man, just come and bless him, uh, bless others, not him, but other children, 
right? Just with a cash gift or whatever God might prompt you to do. But would you join me again in thanking Caleb just for uh, blessing us this morning with this? Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Good job. Excellent. Thank you. Well, once again, it's been so good just to be reminded again of the healing that God wants to bring into our lives. So whether you're like Josh can identify with Josh or Zach or Caleb, or maybe there's even something different that you've identified in your own life, an area of brokenness that you still haven't allowed Jesus to heal. I want you just to invite him this morning to walk right into that space today. Walk right into that place of brokenness and let him heal it. You know, the greatest disability that we all have is sin. Sin disables us from being everything that God planned for us to be. Sin keeps us limited. Sin makes us invalids. Sin keeps us broken. But the beautiful thing that Jesus did is he walked right into our space and went to that place called the cross. He gave himself for us. He paid the price for our healing. By his wounds, right, we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. And listen, the beauty of what Jesus does when we allow him to walk in is, is, uh, is, is just an awesome thing. He sets us free to be. You know, and we look at our brokenness and sometimes instead of being victims, let's see it as, as a, a victor, right? We're going to work through this. We're going to be healed emotionally. We're going to be healed with, with our attitudes and our minds. And we're going we're gonna to serve for the glory of God, just like Caleb is doing, like Zach is doing, like Josh is doing. All of these guys, what's similar in the, all of their cases is they allow Jesus to walk into their space. And when you do that, he'll heal you as well. Take you to places that you would never have expected to be. Well, let me pray for you. God, this morning, I'm so grateful that you are our healer. You, you see our brokenness. You see where we're lying. You see where we're hurting. And you walk right into those places and in essence say, do you want to be healed? And on the surface, we would say, yes, we want this. But deep down below the surface, you're working something even better, perhaps than our physical healing, perhaps even better than the fact that we will be able to walk. You're working something in us that becomes an inspiration to others, that becomes a message that we want to share, that we can't wait to share with other people of just how God has taken our conditions and our brokenness and brought some healing to it. God, I thank you for paying the price for all of our sickness and our disability of sin on that cross. And God, we just cherish that this morning and just praise you for paying it all and giving us that healing and hope that we so need. In Jesus' name, amen.